Hi, I'm Priscilla Weggers, the founder and volunteer curator of the University of Idaho's Asian American Comparative Collection, or AACC for short. I have a PhD in History, Historical Archaeology from the University of Idaho, and have written or edited several books on the history of Asian Americans in the Pacific Northwest. The AACC is a unit of the Alfred W. Bowers Laboratory of Anthropology at the University of Idaho, Moscow. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, the lab became involved in archaeological excavations of Chinese sites, mostly mining related. Because these sites yielded artifacts made in China, there was a need to understand these objects, their uses, and the people who owned them. So in 1982, I established the Chinese Comparative Collection, which subsequently became the Asian Comparative Collection, and finally the Asian American Comparative Collection. The AACC began and still serves as a re unique repository of artifacts and bibliographical materials useful for understanding Asian American archaeological sites, economic contributions, and cultural history. During the past four decades, the AACC's focus has broadened to advocate for accurate artifact descriptions, to encourage sensitive museum exhibits, to change racist or insensitive geographic names, and to expose anti-Asian legends, myths, stereotypes, and terminology. Since its founding, the AACC has tried to obtain an actual example, or where that is not possible, a photograph, of every representative object of Asian manufacture that has been or is likely to be found in an archaeological or museum context in the western United States. At the time, California archaeologist Jan Whitlow described this as a grand and noble undertaking, but also asked, do you know what you're getting into? Well, no, I didn't. The artifacts in the AACC have been acquired through excavation, purchase, or donation from interested people. Bibliographical materials such as books and articles form the nucleus of an extensive reference library emphasizing site reports, artifact identification, and historical documentation, and thousands of images are available for study. Unlike museum objects in glass cases, the AACC artifacts provide a hands-on approach to understanding Asian American historical archaeology from the early 1860s onward. The major artifact classes now represented in the AACC include food and beverage containers, table ceramics, medicinal paraphernalia, gambling-related items, and other personal and domestic objects. The AACC also houses many examples of Asian restaurant ceramics, the Stephen Martin collection of opium smoking antiques, and a growing variety of materials depicting anti-Asian propaganda and stereotypes. Finally, the AACC is a teaching, study, and research collection whose purpose is to investigate, interpret, understand, and appreciate the history, culture, archaeological sites, and artifacts of past and present Americans of Asian and Asian Pacific Islander ancestry. Specifically, the Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Korean, and other groups who immigrated to the West during the territorial and statehood periods, the Japanese who came to Idaho during World War II when Japanese Americans and permanent resident aliens of Japanese ancestry were held in internment and concentration camps here, and late 20th and early 21st century Asian and Pacific Islander immigrants to this region. All right, now that you've heard a little bit about the founding of the AACC, I am going to give you a tour of the facility. And I am Renee Campbell. I am a historical archaeology PhD student at the University of Idaho, and I am also a research assistant at the AACC. I'm going to be giving a short presentation on some of my research following this tour that also incorporates some of the items from the collection. So hopefully between that and this, you can get a better idea of what the AACC is and how it supports both archaeological research and Asian American heritage. Really quickly before we begin our tour of the facility though, I did want to mention that the reason that this amazing resource exists at all is because of our volunteer curator, Priscilla Wagers, and because of community support. We are a nonprofit research institute, um, and although we're housed at the University of Idaho, we do not receive university funding. So it's largely thanks to donate donors, subscribers, 
and volunteers that this exists at all. And there are a number of things in this collection that I probably can't cover today, so know that as I'm moving through this, if you see anything you're interested in, you can always find more information on our website. So beginning to move into the collection here, um, you'll notice that there are two primary types of things in this collection. We have our artifacts and objects, which I'll be showing you a lot of today, and then we also have a pretty large library of documents. And the documents I'm not really going to touch on today, but I wanted to mention them because they're also available for research and because it's the documents that give us a lot of the information um, to learn about the objects in our collection. So behind me you can see the nucleus of our comparative collection. You might be wondering what an archaeological comparative collection is. and Basically, the point of this collection is so that if you were out at an archaeological site and found an object and didn't know what it was, you could take it and compare it to something in this collection, which we do know a lot about, and then begin to identify that object, um, maybe figure out what it was used for, where it was made, when it was made, things like that. And in order to do that, we have two types of things in this uh, comparative collection. We do have some artifacts that were recovered from archaeological sites, but the majority of the materials in here are non-archaeological, and that's important for two reasons. It's important because um, many of the things that you'll see here are more complete and in better condition than things that would have been found in the ground or on the ground. But it's also important because that means that when researchers like me or other folks touch these, uh, we don't have to worry that we might be damaging an actual archaeological artifact. So here we're kind of going to begin with um, some of the Japanese ceramics in this collection and I'm going to give you just a quick example of how we use some of these items. One of probably the most frequent research requests that we get is for help in identifying some fragment found on a site. And that happened recently. Some archaeologists in Oregon sent us pictures of a piece of porcelain that looked pretty similar to this one here. It was small enough that you couldn't really see the pattern or many of the manufacturer marks and it didn't have a maker's mark. So we took those photos and we compared it to examples from our collections and we found a nice match in this cup here. And this is a Euro-American style cup, but it was made in Japan. And because of what we know about this, we were able to tell the archaeologists in Oregon that what they had was also likely a 19th or early 20th century Japanese ceramic, that it was a transfer print design, um, and that it had a cloud and fly flying dragon pattern on it. So that's an example of how we would use these materials. Uh, we also have, in addition to Japanese objects, we have a large number of Chinese objects in the collection. And then as we move further along, you might notice some Thai or Korean or other Asian artifacts. And having kind of this variety of Asian artifacts is important to us because it allows us to see some of the differences and similarities between them. Um, this tray down here contains some Chinese ceramics, and these are covered in a glaze that's known as wintergreen. You might have also heard this referred to as celadon. Archaeologists used to kind of primarily call this celadon, but in recent years it's come to light that that term um, it's maybe less accurate than wintergreen, so we've been kind of transitioning our terminology. And terminology is actually something you'll hear a little bit more in the research presentation following this. But this is a glaze that has some pretty close correlates both in Japanese and Korean ceramics. So if I pull up this Japanese ceramic here, you can see it's a very similar glaze. It's called seji. And then I pulled a Korean ceramic from further down the line here, and that's a Korean celadon that also looks very similar. So if you had just found a little piece of one of these things on an archaeological site, it might be really hard to tell whether, for example, it was Japanese or Chinese. But because we have all these different ones in our collection that you can compare it to, you can kind of begin to see some of the small differences in glaze tint or decoration uh, that would help you to identify the item. And identifying the item might be important just to know what it is, but sometimes it also tells you more about the historical record of a site. And a kind of nice example of this um, about a year ago, we had an email from an archaeologist in Alaska, and she had been working on a cannery site known to have been occupied by Chinese um, laborers. And she emailed us what she thought was a kind of unusual looking Chinese ceramic. We were able to look through the collection and figure out it was actually a Japanese rice bowl. And then she went back through the historic documents and did a little more digging and actually uncovered evidence that there had been Japanese laborers there, as well as the Chinese, and that gave her more information about that site that might have been lost if she hadn't taken the time to um, kind of look into that unusual ceramic. So another reason to have a wide variety of materials in your comparative collection is that some materials deteriorate faster than others. This tray here has some gaming artifacts, including um, a wooden domino that was recovered archaeologically. And you can see this is sort of deteriorated. It might be hard to identify if you found just this on a site. 
So again, it's nice to have that example and a more pristine example of what it might have looked like originally in the packaging. And it would also give you an example of things that you might find in your site that could be associated with this. Moving up here, we have some larger items in the collection that are above us on the shelves, including some of these large jars that um, might be hard to find archeologically because they're large and might get broken, or also, unfortunately, they might make nice targets for looters if they were so complete. And if you've ever worked at a Chinese diaspora site, you might have already recognized a lot of this stuff as Chinese brown glazed stoneware, which is super common on archeological sites in the West. Um, and we have a really wide variety of these vessels from super tiny to really large. We also have some more modern ones with labels that can tell us what ingredients were actually in this uh, and how, for example, the container might have been sealed. And having this big variety of objects helps us to find certain attributes that might um, indicate whether it was a spouted jar or a larger jar, and that would tell us what had been in here and also how people had used them. Interestingly, a lot of Chinese brown glazed stoneware gets reused in archaeological sites, and this is a fun example of that. This was a Chinese brown glazed liquor bottle that after, presumably after the person had emptied the contents, was really intentionally chipped around the edge here um, in order to make a small bowl. And so that's an artifact that had a second life and a totally different use in that second life. Moving forward in the collection, we also have some more modern items. The AACC has a pretty good sized collection of 20th century Chinese restaurant wares, and that might seem more modern than you would expect in an archeological collection, but archeological definitions of historic range anywhere from 50 years to 100 years. So a lot of these things are technically historic and those that aren't yet will be very soon. And these are already being found on archeological sites. Um, in Boston last year, they did a dig in Chinatown and they recovered a small fragment of a restaurant ware with this boundless longevity pattern. Um, and that was in a lot that had been occupied by a succession of Chinese restaurants since the 1930s. And so finding that small fragment helped to tell the archeologists what age of deposits they were moving through. We also have some even more modern items in our collection. Uh, you'll notice here we have some paper takeout containers and I was surprised when I first saw these in the collection, but it turns out that folded paper takeout containers are actually quite old. The first patent for these was in the 1890s. Um, and these are not that old, but they do, if you look, have a characteristic that would tell one from the other, and that's this wire handle. The wire, and ha the wire handle was on the original patent design, um, but modern examples don't have it, and that's because as we moved into the modern era and wanted to reheat Chinese takeout in the microwave, the handle had to be removed. So that, even though these are relatively new, they'd still tell an interesting story that might become more and more relevant as archeologists move into the future. And that's why they're in our collection. Um, and that's kind of the end of what I have laid out today. So if you're interested to learn more, you can always look at our website. You can find contact information there for Priscilla Wiggers or for at me. Uh, and you can also follow us on Instagram at AACC underscore UIdaho, or you can subscribe to our newsletter, which has four issues a year, and at just $10 helps to support the resources that you see here.